In this episode, we're going to look at carbohydrates. So our four macromolecules, remember, are proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and fats. Carbohydrates can basically be broken down into simple carbohydrates and complex carbohydrates. So in this video, we're going to look at the structure of each of those and the function of each of those. So first, we will start by looking at our monosaccharides. Monosaccharides, mono meaning one, and saccharide means sweet. We have three different monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, and galactose. So I want to point out that the chemical formula for all of these is C6H12O6, because they all have six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. The only difference is where they are located. With glucose, there's five carbons in the ring, one carbon out here. Fructose has four carbons in the ring, and there's a carbon on each side outside of the ring. Galactose just simply has this hydrogen and hydroxyl group flipped compared to glucose. So they all have the same chemical formula. The other category of simple sugar is disaccharides. So the disaccharides are still simple carbohydrates, but now we are putting two sugars together. So there are three important disaccharides that we're going to look at. The first one is sucrose. Sucrose is composed of a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule. Sucrose is our table sugar. This will include things like honey and syrup and brown sugar and molasses and any, any of those sugars are going to be some ratio of glucose and fructose. When we combine these two monosaccharides, we are using a process called dehydration synthesis. So we lose a hydroxyl group from one and a hydrogen from the other and that leaves as a water molecule. So that's dehydration synthesis. So when this water molecule leaves, we form this bond. When we have sucrose, we have a glucose molecule and a fructose molecule. The other two sugars, so the next one is maltose. Maltose is combined of glucose and glucose. Same thing happens, we lose a water molecule, dehydration synthesis, and these two sugars combine. The last one is lactose. So with lactose, we are combining a glucose molecule with a galactose molecule. Same thing, dehydration synthesis, we remove a water molecule and we form this bond. When we put two monosaccharides together, we get either sucrose, maltose, or lactose. One of the kinds of sugars that you may hear about that's bad for you is called high fructose corn syrup. The only difference between high fructose corn syrup and normal table sugar is the ratio of glucose and fructose. There's 55% fructose and only 45% glucose instead of being 50-50. So they're not that much different. It's still sugar. High fructose corn syrup is used to put into things um, like soda, right? So pop and um, canned fruit and barbecue sauce and all kinds of things because fructose tastes a little bit sweeter. So fructose tastes a bit sweeter than glucose or even sucrose. So when you have just that little bit of extra fructose, then you can put more sugar into that product. Another thing that I want to talk about is lactose. So where do these sugars come from? We talked about how sucrose is table sugar. Maltose, where does that come from? This is two glucose molecules put together. This comes from digesting starch. When we digest starches, 
then we eventually end up with these disaccharides. Then lactose over here, where do we find lactose? Lactose is found in milk. Sometimes people are lactose intolerant. What is going on there? When we have lactose, which is a disaccharide, we consume that sugar with milk. We need to digest that. It has to be broken up into monosaccharides so that we can absorb them into our bloodstream. When you're lactose intolerant, then what's happening is all of these microorganisms in your digestive tract, some of them, most of them are good guys, then if you can't digest the lactose, then they will. If you digest the lactose, then you will absorb both of those monosaccharides and everything is fine. If you can't digest the lactose, that means you are missing an enzyme called lactase. So lactase breaks that disaccharide down into glucose and galactose. So people that do not have this enzyme will not break down the sugar. Then that means all of these microorganisms in your digestive tract, they will eat the lactose and they will digest it. So when that happens, you end up with all of the symptoms of lactose intolerance, like gas and bloating, cramps, any of those sort of diarrhea symptoms that go along with lactose intolerance. That's our simple sugars. Simple sugars, or simple carbohydrates, are the monosaccharides and the disaccharides. There are six of them. The next category is our complex carbohydrates. So we call those polysaccharides, and there are three different polysaccharides that I wanna talk about. The first one is starch. We often think of starches as our foods like potatoes and rice, pasta, cereal, bread. These are all foods that contain starch. What is starch made up of? Every single monosaccharide in starch is glucose. Every single glucose molecule is bonded together through dehydration synthesis, just like when we were making disaccharides, except now we're making polysaccharides. So these are gonna be long chains of glucose. There are no other monosaccharides in starch. These glucose molecules are all bonded together into long chains and it produces all of these foods that we enjoy. Starch is a stored form of energy in plant cells. So plants store the starch and then we eat the starch and we get energy from it. The next one is called glycogen. Glycogen is also made of glucose only glucose molecules. So what's the difference? What's the difference between starch and glycogen? It's how they're bonded together. So you can notice here that glycogen can sometimes be branched. It doesn't just form one long chain. Where do we find glycogen? Glycogen is in our liver and our muscles. This is our stored energy. We can store a little bit of carbohydrate. Plants store starch and then we eat the plants. Animals store glycogen. We don't get very much glycogen when we eat meat or if we eat liver. When we cook it, the glycogen is a little bit broken down, so we don't really get glycogen from eating food. We store glycogen. So if you eat starch, you digest it, you break it down into individual glucose molecules, then we absorb those into the bloodstream, then our body reassembles those into glycogen, and we can store that in our liver and our muscles, and that's our sort of backup. We have a little bit of a supply of glycogen to break down so that we can make energy. Cellulose is our third polysaccharide. Cellulose is also made of glucose 
only. So all of these monosaccharides that are in the cellulose are still glucose. And again, what's the difference between cellulose and glycogen and starch? The difference is how they're bonded together. So when we had our starch molecules, they were bonded in a slightly different way compared to cellulose. Where do we find cellulose? Cellulose is also in plants, but cellulose is not an energy molecule. In plants, cellulose is a structural molecule. This makes up cell walls. It is not a form of energy. So what happens when we eat cellulose? We find cellulose in fruit and vegetables. It's the cell walls of the plants. What do we call this in our diet? We call this fiber. We cannot digest cellulose. So what's interesting is that when we eat starch, starch is chains of glucose molecules put together, and we digest those into individual glucose molecules, and then we absorb them. And we either use it to make energy, or we turn it into glycogen. We can turn some into fat as well. When we eat cellulose, which is also just chains of glucose, we can't digest them because the bonds are put together in a different way. We don't have enzymes that can break down cellulose. So fiber is also a polysaccharide. It is also found in plants, just like starch. But because these bonds are different, we don't have enzymes to break them down. Fiber is still a very important component of our diet. Even though we don't digest it and use it for energy, we need to have fiber to have bowel health. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. When we look at the glycemic index, we are looking at how that food affects our blood sugar. When we eat carbohydrates, whether they're simple carbohydrates like sugars or complex carbohydrates like starch, we break them all down into glucose. If it's simple sugars, we're gonna break it down into glucose and fructose. When those absorb into our bloodstream, we need a hormone that will tell the cells to take up that blood sugar. We wanna have our blood sugar regulated if we don't, if we have spikes and, and dips in our blood sugar level, it's going to affect our energy and you'll feel tired or moody if you've ever been hangry before. It's because you've had low blood sugar. We look at the glycemic index. We are looking at how the food affects insulin. When we produce insulin, we decrease our blood sugar because insulin tells the cells to take up the blood sugar. Here are some examples of foods that have either a low, medium, or high glycemic index. So the higher the glycemic index, the more your blood sugar is going to fluctuate because of insulin production. So you can see over here, low glycemic index foods are healthier kinds of foods, whole grains and vegetables and chickpeas and rice. These things are not going to have a massive impact on insulin compared to foods in the high glycemic category. So you should have an idea of how the glycemic index works. High glycemic index foods cause an increase in insulin production. Low glycemic index foods don't cause spikes and dips in insulin production. So when you eat these kinds of foods and some of these kinds of foods, medium is okay. Anything below 70, you know, is kind of a good thing. You're not going to have major blood sugar fluctuations. Keep an eye on the different kinds of foods that you're eating and make sure you're eating whole foods. How much sugar should we have in a day? just as an example, because what disease do you get if you always make too much insulin? What if you eat high sugar diet for many years? Do you know what disease you could start to have? You could have type two diabetes, right? So insulin resistance will happen when you eat too much sugar and make too much insulin. So we wanna minimize that, right? So it's not good for us to eat all kinds of sugar. So we wanna minimize that and keep it to about 25 grams per day.
25 grams of sugar per day. Just to give you an example, an apple would have somewhere between 8 and 10 grams, and a can of Coke would have about 38 grams. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea. If you stick to whole foods, you're gonna be fine. The last thing that I wanna talk about is fiber. So fiber is the complex carbohydrate that we can't digest, right? Cellulose, plant cell walls. But we actually have two kinds of fiber. So there's soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber are things that become gelatinous. So soluble means it's soluble in water. Gelatinous kinds of fiber help to lubricate the bowel. So it helps make bowel movements easier. Some examples would be fruit. The pectin in fruit is a sol uh, soluble fiber. Chia seeds. If you've ever put chia seeds into a smoothie, you can see how they absorb and hold water. These have a lot of fiber, very good for your digestive tract. Insoluble fiber is not dissolvable in water. So that is our cellulose. This is the complex carbohydrate that we just talked about and we cannot digest it, we can't break it down. It is important because it gives us bulk. When you have um, a large volume of substances in the large intestine, it stimulates bowel movements. So having cellulose in your diet is important to help keep your bowel movements regular. So you're going to find insoluble fibers in things like whole grains and legumes. The other thing I wanna mention is fiber is a prebiotic. Maybe you've heard about probiotics. Probiotics are bacteria foods like yogurt or homemade sauerkraut and having good microbacteria, microorganisms in our digestive tract has a lot of health benefits. A prebiotic is basically food for the probiotics. So eating fiber helps to feed your healthy gut bacteria. We want to have fiber to prevent constipation and to feed our good bacteria and to reduce the risk of things like colon cancer. So having a lot of fiber in your diet is a very healthy thing to do. How much do you need? 25 grams. You want to decrease sugar to 25 grams or less. You want to increase fiber to 25 grams or more. So that makes it easy to remember if you remember 25. Here are some examples of foods that have fiber. It's going to be things like whole grains, fruit and vegetables, nuts and seeds. Okay, last thing that I want to do is show you a summary slide. So we talked about a lot of things monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. Mm -hmm.